everyone. Welcome uh, to Westchester Real Estate Investors Meetup. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we've taken our meetups virtual uh, due to the pandemic, and uh, so we have not been meeting uh, at the uh, the location that we usually do in Harrison. Uh, but anyway, this is the next best thing because we get to hear from people all over the country who's doing wonderful things, and um, it seems like our audience has definitely grown. So this is uh, just wonderful, wonderful to see everybody. Um, if you want to follow myself, Westchester Real Estate Investors, um, all of the uh, information on how to get in touch with me is in the comments. I already sent in the chat box at the top, so you can take a look and take back, follow me on all of the social media. If you're just joining, please mute. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I am the founder and the principal for Goldstein Property Partners. I'm a real estate syndicator for multifamily properties, uh, apartment complexes, and I'm excited to announce that we are now in contract on a co apartment complex in Indianapolis, a $10.5 million project that we are joint venturing with another group. Um, thank you all so much. So if you guys want to know about that, if you, any of you are passive investors in the group and you want to get involved, um, if you'd like to reach out to me, my contact information is in the chat box. Um, if you guys are looking to do something with your 401k or your self-directed IRA, especially during this time, looking for a better return, please contact me. I'll put you in touch with a wonderful accountant who can give you all the details on how to access that capital so that you're able to invest passively in real estate. Okay, so um, also want to mention that um, we launched our accountability program la uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we sent out surveys, uh, just a little bit on that. If you're interested in doing something in real estate, but you haven't gotten that, you know, motivation or you need that partner to just um, kind of give you more of a, you know, just a push, not a partner to do deals with you, but to kind of help you get ahead, uh, emailed, email me and I'll send you the link. Uh, again, my contact information is in the chat. We can uh, partner you up with someone, pair you up with someone. We've been doing that. Uh, for those of you that have already sent in your survey, please be patient. It's just myself that's pairing everyone, and I'm working on putting together bios so that I can pair you guys. So um, it's there's no charge for it. I'm just doing it, you know, because I want people in the group to start being more interactive and, um, you know, start to to do things and, and, and see results. So um, very, very excited about tonight's session. Um, I want to introduce um, Patrick. Patrick is someone that I've met recently. He is doing incredible things in North Carolina, and you guys are just going to love his story, um, and I'm going to introduce him. Patrick, go ahead, introduce yourself. Um, it will be a pleasure to uh, interview you tonight. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I think I know who the accountant is that you're talking about. Oh, okay, um, hold on one second, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgot somebody very, very important. My co-host, Adam Churko. Adam, please introduce yourself. <laughs> sorry. Well, no, no. I mean, that's, I mean, we're, we're all here for the interview anyway. Um, <laughs> those who don't know me, I'm Adam Churko. Uh, I've been helping Rochelle with the, the meetup over at Uncle Henry's in, in Harrison for uh, a while since she had her last child and uh, just super passionate about keeping everybody together and helping anybody get through whatever they're doing, whether it be buy and sell. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actively investing as well. And uh, yeah, just hello. If I haven't met you, hopefully we'll get together in person in the near future. Otherwise uh, we'll, we'll, we'll meet here virtually. <laughs> Wonderful. If you guys are looking Thanks for, sure. yes, of course, if you guys are looking for a real estate agent um, in the Westchester area, um, Adam's also licensed in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, too. Connecticut. Yeah. So if you guys need any help uh, with anything to do with buying or selling, um, Adam is definitely your guy. Highly recommend. Great guy to work with. So thank we, you so much, We can Adam. also hook you up anywhere in the country, Canada, Australia, or the UK now. So, All right. Um, All right. Anything, awesome. Let us know. <laughs> okay. Patrick, thank you so much for your patience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. Thank you, Rochelle. This is awesome. Um, I know from talking to you and from hearing about the stuff that you're doing, it's it's very exciting. I'm very excited to see what you have and try to replicate it down here. So um, my story, basically just my background, I'm from Minnesota originally. I live down in Charlotte, North Carolina now. Um, I, I grew up in 
just outside of Minneapolis. Um, I grew up in a house where my mom was a very, uh, she had a very successful and pretty large Mary Kay team. Um, and so I grew up around the, you know, that business, that mindset, that uh, really all of it. I, she was at all of my baseball games. She was at all my school events. She was at everything. And um, and I saw the way she was able to balance it all, and which has now really been a big, um, a really big driver for me. But um, <laughs> ever since I saw that as a kid, I kind of had the entrepreneurial buzz. Um, and that's one of the ones that I mentioned to you that I don't think I told you the full story about. But when I was a little kid, it was uh, I, I had this my first business was uh, selling Mary Kay CDs. Um, I would I would pedal my bike over to Office Depot and buy all the CD supplies and everything else. And then take orders, make the CDs, go pedal my bike over to the post office, ship them out, and then go over to the to the bank and deposit everything. Turns out now, I think that's, I think it's called pirating, but um, when I was like <laughs> 10, it's not that big of a deal. So, um, but fast forward a bit, uh, I went to Iowa State University, studied business there, did ROTC for the Army. Um, and after I graduated, I, I went on active duty, spent six years on active duty as an infantry officer. And then um, just about a little over two years ago, got out, transitioned into PricewaterhouseCoopers um, as a consultant there, working in banking, capital markets, working primarily with payments companies, with banks, um, working on risk right now, um, getting ready to transition to do another job here before too long. So, um, and it's been while working at PwC that I, I transitioned into, or not transitioned, but also part-time getting into real estate investing over the past year, really. Um, and we can talk obviously a lot more about that, but. Awesome. Well, I guess uh, you're going to tell us how you got started in real estate. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, so I've, I mean, with the, with it all in the back of my mind, I, you know, as I left Kansas, I was stationed in Kansas when I was in the army at the end. Right. Um, and so what's that? No, I oh, think somebody. Sorry, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so when I when I got ready to leave there, I was I started thinking more and more about real estate, kind of wishing that I had, you know, after spending six years in a place or five, six years, um, kind of wish I had bought something there. Um, but I really, after I moved here, that was that was my plan. I moved um, into an apartment, took a year. My plan was take a year to learn the area, use my VA loan, get into a house with no down payment, um, and kind of slow roll it and leapfrog, you know, owner occupied house, owner occupied house every year. Um, that didn't happen. That changed. Um, within about a year, I bought the house that I'm in now uh, with a VA loan, again, no down. And then from there, uh, about two or three months later is when everything really kind of kicked off. So June of last year, um, I had been doing for the past, previous six months, probably been doing a lot of the research, kind of getting my mind right, doing a lot of the um, setting the groundwork for everything, increasing my productivity, increasing my networking, um, really learning about it a lot. And I still had the same kind of game plan in place, but there's one very distinct event I remember going to. It was a, an appreciation event for my real estate agents team. Um, and they, I had one conversation with one couple and they, they didn't say anything groundbreaking in particular, but they talked about the properties that they had. Um, and it was at that moment that I, I left there thinking to myself, what am I doing? Why am I not? Like, it's just, it's time to start doing something. Um, and so I did, that was on June 6th of last year. Um, within about a week, I had a property identified within about three weeks. I had it under contract. It was fourplex. Um, a couple weeks later, probably three weeks after that, I had another six units under contract. Um, and then by the end of the year, I closed in September and then had a total of 12 by the end of the year. Um, there were a lot of plenty of headaches, plenty of lessons learned with that, but, um, that's really, that was how it started. And that was kind of the really that one pivotal moment where it goes from, I mean, everybody talks about the importance of taking action. Um, that really kicked me in the pants and said that maybe you should just actually do something now. So. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. Can you talk to us about some of the challenges that you faced um, during your journey? Yeah. Um, so that the first deal, uh, there were a number of them. Um, the first deal in particular, and I'm still dealing with that first deal. Uh the acquisition process, I mean, I think it really boils down to a couple of different things and a couple of different ways to overcome everything, which is being persistent, being able to think outside the box, and then just having a really the most important one, having a why that grounds you that you can go back to. Um, on my on that first deal, I ended up having um, four different closing dates, three different appraisals, um, 
two or three different lenders. Uh, I had a, a property or I had a, an appraiser that went out at the same time as an inspector, which didn't realize that that was a horrible idea at the time. But the appraiser and the inspector both talked. The inspector was just being an honest guy, talked about the property a little bit. Um, and when he did, he made some comments about the condition that the appraiser got a little bit lazy and wrote directly into his report. Um, so the report came back at appraised, this was a week before closing. It came back, it appraised exactly for the dollar amount, um, but it appraised as a C4 condition. And so the bank wouldn't lend on it. Um, and he didn't cite anything that needed to be fixed. He just cited actual quotes, comments from the, uh, from the inspector. So that was, that was one big lesson learned um, and really pushing through the, the struggles of those, you know, trying to get the closing with those. Another very big one is in terms of inherited tenants and property management. So I, uh, I went cheap up front on property management. Um, I, I did it very uh, knowingly and I guess stupidly, but I got what I paid for and I got what I asked for. Um, learned a lot of very hard lessons that way with dealing with them and really feeling like I was doing a lot of the property management myself. Uh, while also still paying them, which was fantastic. Um, so you, you use a property management firm for all of your your properties. Yeah, I do. Okay. And I didn't I didn't really mention it with PwC um, with my full time work, but I up until COVID, I travel every week, four days a week. So I really, uh, I, I mean, I don't have good enough systems in place anyway to do it, but I really didn't have the ability to manage it on my own with or the time or the interest really. Sure. So you um, pick up these properties and you hold the, all of them, right? You don't just you don't do flips or wholesaling. You just do buy and holds. That's your strategy. Yeah, it is ultimately. Um, if I think one of the things that I enjoyed the most is trying to figure out how to creatively structure a deal. So if the deal is, you know, there's one that I'm looking at right now that's a, a portfolio. It's got a fourplex and um, two parcels that each have two single family homes on them. So in a case like that, I would have, you know, to make the numbers work and to make everything work, especially with my goal to be in multifamily, um, I would happily buy the whole portfolio, sell off, you know, whether wholesaling or flipping, whatever made the most sense numbers wise, flipping or wholesaling the the other properties, and then essentially recouping my cash for the multifamily. But ultimately, everything is to drive towards the goal of long term hold. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us about the best deal that you've ever done. Uh, so I had, it was really the, the second one that I had. Um, it was a, a little bit unique. It was a portfolio. It was three duplexes that were all on the same property. Um, they all, each one, they were small. Each one was a studio apartment. Um, and so I'm going into it. I, I partnered with a buddy of mine, um, and it ended up working out very well. He lives up in DC. Um, his goal was, that he had some money that he just didn't have anything to do with. It was in the mutual fund. Uh, my goal was to expend as little of my money as possible so that I could retain my capital for additional deals. Um, so we wound up wanting to partner together on it. And then came the next hurdle, which was the, uh, the financing. So I had to go commercial financing due to the structure of the property and the six units, which was fine and worked out well for us. Um, but one of the terms of our partnership was that he didn't want to be underwritten on the loan. Um, and so finding a bank that would do that, which using a local bank wasn't too hard, but the biggest thing was, um, since they were all in one parcel, but there were three separate duplexes, I wanted to subdivide them to maximize the value to have conventional financing as an option. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I had a financing option that didn't have prepayment penalties, which a lot of the commercial options did. So, um, found one that worked, uh, moved forward with it. And after closing, all six units were rented out. Um, had a property manager on there. None of, I mean, they're not the best. The the max rent right now they're all stabilized at 450 bucks a month for rent. Um, so coming from from New Yorkers, that's uh, I I don't know that that's a thing in the past hundred years, but um, it is in Statesville, North Carolina. So it's just a little bit north of the Charlotte area. So can you talk about the numbers just so that they relate? You know. Um, Talk about like how yeah. much you paid for it and, you know, a little bit more about the structure of that and how you financed it, um, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So this was a purchase price of 155 It was listed for uh, just under $180. Um, 
picked up for 155 right now or well when i purchased it they were all rented for a combined uh 2400 just over 2400 um and then with i put a total of probably if you include the subdivision i put just under seven thousand dollars into it and rented it for uh, right now 2700 total um i have the appraisal tomorrow to see what it's worth on the back end it should come in at around 210 for the portfolio um so 2700 on a roughly 200 210 not too bad awesome that's pretty incredible yeah yeah, yeah. so are you planning to hold that long term or what what is your what is your plan with that yeah it's uh i do want to hold it long term it the Statesville area is the Charlotte area is great. I love Charlotte. I have um, that's where my home is. I don't have any investments directly in the city of Charlotte. Um, I just west of Charlotte and Gastonia. That's a, a growing area as well. Statesville is kind of stagnant. It needs some major changes to um, to really become like the next Charlotte or Gastonia in the area. But it is stable, and so it's uh, you know the property values aren't going to increase a ton. Um, compared to what they are now, at least not to be worth selling in a couple of years and have that be my long-term strategy. But in the meantime, I'm going to collect between my partner and I about $800 a month in cash flow on it. Um, so that's that's really what I'm looking to do with it. And we're doing with the refinance that we're doing. We're not looking to do a cash out and pull everything out, but um, because we don't want to increase the balance on it. But we do have a commercial lender that'll do a term loan on the actual loan value. Um, plus enough to cover closing costs. And then we'll have, for the remaining equity up to 80%, we'll have a line of credit available on the rest. So that'll give us some long-term uh, ability to jump into the next deals as well. Awesome. How do you finance your deals? Uh, there are a variety. Right now, the majority of them have been through either commercial or conventional financing. Um, they've been in just good enough condition, essentially, to, to qualify. Um, I have one deal in flight right now that is with a hard money lender. Um, actually just got word back that the appraisal came in about 20K higher than they expected. So that's great news. Um, but that's primarily through one of them. Actually, all but one of them is through a partnership. Um, some of them are just splitting, you know, portion of equity for uh, me paying a lower portion of the down payment. Um, other ones are 50-50. Um, and then the one is uh, through our LLC, through... Um, the commercial loan. So, okay. so you, you find a little bit of variety. Like private lenders and then that's how you do it with like down payments and stuff like that. Is that, or do you use all your own cash? Uh, the down payments have been, so one of them was through my own cash, just a hundred percent through my own cash. Um, and then since the other ones were all through partnerships, they were a combination of partnerships bringing the majority of the down payment plus, um, you know, whatever the, the term of the loan was covering the rest of it or the private money covering, um, or I mean, excuse me, hard money covering the majority of it. So total between my entire portfolio, um, if I do the math real quick off the top of my head, I probably have in down payments under um, $70,000 put into all of them. Awesome. awesome. So, okay. That's, that's, that's pretty incredible. So, um, how, how have you been able to do all of this with a full-time job and, and, and just, I mean, because, you know, you're about to be, you're about to be owner of 20 units, um, once you close on, on the other one. So how, how do you, how do you manage this? It's, um, a lot of time prioritization is, I guess, the biggest thing, um, when I was traveling a lot, taking advantage of, I mean, my, my routine was basically I wake up in the morning, knock out whatever I can knock out in, you know, an hour before I get ready to go to work. Um, and then after work, I spend the rest of the night in my hotel room working on my business. Um, same thing with, you know, on my flights, I would, you know, maybe once every couple of months, I would allow myself to um, watch a movie on a flight, but otherwise it was doing some type of work to move my business forward. Um, and I think a, a very big part of it has been networking, trying to build relationships with, you know, a bunch of different people here in Charlotte area. I also invest in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, so building relationships with those people to kind of leverage their expertise and then really honing in on the areas that I need to and being very, very, very deliberate about my time. I use a lot of uh, 
Have you read, I think, I don't remember. I think we talked about it. Have you read the 12 week year? No, I have not. Have talked about that one? Okay. The 12, so I, 12 week year? Yeah, the 12 week year. Okay. Um, right. I use a combination of that with a few other things with like that, the Miracle Morning. Um, I, I'm reading the Miracle Morning Millionaire right now too that kind of ties the, the mm-hmm. wealth mindset twist into it. Um, but all those combined, they, they talk a lot to, oh, and I forgot about the four disciplines of execution. Um, if you haven't read that book, that is a fantastic book for developing systems and, and helping you kind of work towards your goals too. So, um, all you those combined, I've kind time. of like, yeah, that one is the four disciplines of execution. Thanks. Uh, it's by Chris McChesney, I think. I can, Rochelle, if you want, after we get done with this, I can send you a list of a couple oh, yeah. of those. That Absolutely. I yeah, that would be great. Um, so uh, we had a question here. We're going to go through the questions in a little bit, but uh, one one person said, "How do you? How are you finding the deals? How are you finding your deals?" Uh, the first couple were off the MLS. Um, just straight off the MLS. The first one, the first couple had been sitting on the market for a while, um, and now, now as I am six months into my uh, the tenants and the problems with the tenants. Oh, don't let me forget to mention the toilet lady after this. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, after about six months of dealing with this rehab and with all the problems with it, I can see why it's set on the market for a while, but it's all right. It'll, it'll be worth it in the end. Um, and then I have two of them that are under contract right now. One of them was through a wholesaler and another one was, uh, it was through a, a real estate agent, but got it before it came on the market. He gave me a call when it was getting ready to get posted. So. Okay. So tell us about the toilet lady. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I told you I inherited tenants out of the one in Gastonia. Uh, I had, there was one tenant in particular, they were all paying 350 bucks a month in rent, um, next to nothing. Um, th- one of the first things that I did besides raising rent just a little bit, which she pitched a fit about was, um, I, utilities aren't split. Uh, well, I'm sorry, water isn't split. The rest of utilities are. So I did a, a chargeback of a massive $30 a month per tenant. Um, and I was out there working one day and she's, um, I, whenever I go out there and work, I, I don't, since I have a property manager, I always defer to them. And I always just say, I work for the property management company. So she does her whole complaining about everything and about how ridiculous this $30 increase is. Um, and, you know, said something about the lease and about how, you know, it's, well, you know, at least the rent's only 350 bucks. And she's like, oh, that lease is full of all sorts of tenant landlord violations. It's like, oh, that's not good. Like what? And she's like, oh, it's just old. Um, so that's just kind of the person that said the same for the person that she was. And then we gave her a notice to vacate. She didn't leave. Um, so before we filed eviction, tried to offer cash for keys, um, forgive rent, all that kind of stuff. Just please leave, get out of my life and I'll give you a little bit of money. Just give me your keys. Um, and she said, no, she'd been living there for about five years before I took over. Um, she said, first of all, no. Second of all, um, I want my security deposit plus six years of interest on it. And third, I installed the toilet or I replaced the toilet. So I'm taking the toilet with me or you can pay me for it. So um, that was when she became toilet lady. Luckily, she didn't take the toilet. But then she did call. uh, She called the city to complain about um, code violations. So um, (laughs) then I. She's been out of the unit for about three months, but her her presence is still felt on a daily basis. <laughs> That's so. awesome. Yeah. Uh, right. Patty wants to know what does it mean for your partner that your partner doesn't want to be underwritten? Is he on the mortgage? If not, please explain how he puts up the down payment, but the bank gives only you the mortgage and who's on the deed. Lots of questions That's, in there. So- yeah, that's a it's a really good question, and that was part of what I struggled with so much in finding a lender. Um, that's why I went with a commercial lender because there was a lot more flexibility. Um, there's no way you're going to be able to do that with a, a conventional Fannie Freddie loan. Um, so I found it's it was purchased and deeded through the LLC, where we have a partnership agreement in the LLC, um, and he because of his ownership interest or his lower ownership interest in it. And I think it's got to be under like 25% ownership interest um, in the LLC. As a result, they only, they don't need to underwrite him. They could underwrite me. Um, and so that's how 
that's really how it worked out. And then we can split as a part of our terms. He only owns 25% or whatever the percentage was of the company, but he gets X amount of cash flow or X amount of return. So that was how we were able to structure it. And I, I just went open to the banks that I talked to and said, this is, you know, this is what I'm looking to do. Um, he just, he's looking to buy a house personally. And so he didn't want to take any hits to his credit or anything like that. He didn't want to have additional debt in his name. Um, he just wanted to put some cash in. And so that's how we were able to do it. Understood. Um, did that answer all the questions in there? Um, I believe so. Um, okay. She wants to know um, who is the bank vetting for the commercial loan to an LLC? They were vetting me. So they, they underwrote the entire thing based on me. Okay. Yeah. So Patty, they would be vet, they would be vetting um, Patrick's financials. Um, yeah. Then somebody wants to know, um, do you have an LLC for each property? Um, almost at this point, not, I've struggled with this a lot. I don't, um, I have an LLC per partnership. So if a partner and I invest in multiple properties together, then we'll keep it under the same LLC, at least for now. Um, but for right now, that's how it's structured. So right now I haven't done any with, uh, with multiple, um, or haven't done multiple deals with the same partner. So Right now, it kind of feels like everyone has an LLC, but not exactly. And then we have a question that says, uh, given these are commercial loans, are the loans all non-recourse? No, they're not. My that's I'm underwritten and I'm I'm obligated to pay it. Okay. Um, let's see. We have some more questions, but I'm going to hold the questions that. and we're going to do that at the end. Yeah. Real quick on that one, just the second point to that, I guess, to a little bit more complete answer is I have, I opened the LLC immediately before close, well, as we were under contract for the deal. Um, so I have no business history. I had, there was nothing in the deal. So really they were just underwriting it to, they were underwriting me. The name was under the LLC, but that's, that's really why. So from a, I, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, but I, I can imagine from, um, blurring the lines perspective it probably doesn't help me a lot in that regard but at the end of the day that's what it took to get the deal done in that one so understood okay we're gonna we're gonna come back to the questions in a second but we're gonna try to keep on keep on track here um okay. what's your favorite real estate book or business book um so i mentioned the 12 week year like by the way i got those couple out of the way ahead of time um real estate books i i've read a number, a few of them. I've read a lot of the like the bigger pockets books that I think are good. Um, really, I spent a lot more time on like the business and mindset books. And you know, it, can I give three and how they work together? And I'll keep it quick. Of course. <laughs> okay. Um, there, there are three that are foundational to me for very different reasons. Um, one that not a lot of people have heard of, I don't think, is the Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Um, it's it, it has a lot of similar components to the compound effect where it talks about really gets you in that habit. The whole, the whole idea of it is the little things that you do every single day are the things that are the difference between success and failure. It's not one big thing. It's not one deal that you do. It's not any one thing. It's all of these little things over time. So that really kind of, that was the very first book that I read in October, 2018 that started shifting my mindset and getting me towards this. Second I like one, that. You know, just a side note to that, you know, you see these like, um, You've heard about the the um, the um, the iceberg, you know, and 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 the, the the bulk of the iceberg is under the water. You know, what you see on the top is so much smaller than what's on the bottom. So it's all the little things, you know, that contribute to what you actually see. And when you see someone that has all of a sudden popped up overnight, and you're like, wow, you know, they're an overnight success. But that is absolutely not the case. It's all the little things that they've been doing in the dark that shows up in the light. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, and I, and I can't emphasize that enough. And that's why every time anybody asks about a book, I can't not mention that one because it, it really, it beats it to death to an extent, but it does it in a way that makes sure that you don't forget it. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, second one, the one thing, I know a ton of people have heard about the one thing. Um, if you talk about, like, if you kind of combine the ideas of 
the things that I've talked about before with the 12-week year, the four disciplines of execution, kind of all those different ideas combined, the one thing takes it and channels it into um, this is what you do to get to your long-term goal. And as we talked about before, none of it matters if you don't know what your long-term goal is. Um, so really defining that. And he talks about the dominoes and all those different steps along the way. Um, and then the third one is Tribe of Millionaires. Um, it was written by the, it's Call a very it short book. Say that again. Tribe of Millionaires. Tribe of Millionaires. Okay. Yeah. That one was, it was written by the guys that founded the GoBundance group. Okay. Uh, it's talked about a ton on Bigger Pockets. So that book, it, it's very short. It's written like a story. Um, it is written as a story, uh, but it's all about accountability. It's all about um, the, really the power and impact of the people that are around you and who you surround yourself with. I actually, right behind my computer, I keep, the printout of the six principles that they talk about in the sled edge or in the tribe of millionaires. So really, really, really good book. It took me, I, I started it in one night and had to go to bed. That was the only reason I didn't finish it that night, but um, <laughs> it's, it's huge. This, as soon as I got done with that book, I started doing accountability calls with someone. So to everybody, I would say as a, you know, to tie it into what you're doing, the accountability groups that you guys are starting, um, I would definitely recommend checking out that book because it talks a lot about the power of, of really what that does for you, how you can make it, you know, the different pieces of it that, that are super powerful. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I, I made a video the other day on our, on the page and one of the comments that I, you know, mentioned in there was, you know, using the Facebook group and the, the Westchester real estate Facebook group to, you know, um, shout, make a shout out of what you're working on. You know, if you just close on a deal, you know, sometimes, sometimes you can't write these things on your personal page, you know, because people don't get it, you know, um, mom yeah. and dad thinks you're crazy or, you know, your friend family think you're you know whatever and and so you know it's important who you surround yourself with it's important to have accountability in your life because that's how you absolutely grow so I really love that I think that's a great point so um that kind of leads me to my next question what and who what or who is your why um so I think the biggest biggest why is my parents um my, I mentioned my mom before and my dad in a very similar way um and then both my mom passed away about 10 years ago. My, my dad passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, so that's a, a very big why to do something, build something that would make them proud. Um, and really, I want to, you know, I really want to make a difference in the long term. So um, I have a goal to make a, right now, it, it kind of structured over the last couple of years after um, Hurricane, what was the hurricane that hit North Carolina? Now I'm blanking. Like <laughs> I read. a year and a half ago. I no, it wasn't Irene. Man, I really should know this. Um, Matthew? After, uh, nope, it was after Matthew. I don't remember. I, I'm literally just drawing a blank right now. Um, but after that hit, I did a lot of, I did some disaster relief work for a couple of days. I had a couple, and my boss gave me a chance to get out of work for a couple of days. And so being able to, you know, even though I didn't have as much of an impact there as I would have liked to, it really kind of sparked that drive in me to, to do something bigger than myself. You know, I, I, I grew up going to, you know, going to church and doing mission trips and stuff like that and being able to build something that's bigger than me and have a purpose where I can actually impact people. I would like to do that through a, a disaster relief platform. You know, um, I just want to make a comment on like having a why, like so many people, they just, you know, they don't establish that why, you know, and I think with real estate investing as anything, it's difficult, you know, you're going to, you're going to encounter so many different challenges, you know, throughout um, your journey and having a why is what is going to keep you in those moments when you're like, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this. This is crazy. You know, all the rejection, you know, the, 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 the tenant problems, like whatever it is, the legal problems, you know, it's, that thing that you've identified from the very beginning as to why you do what you do, you know, and if it's, you know, it, your why could be anything, it could be a person, it could be your family, it could be, you know, um, maybe you want a better life, you know, it could be money, money, maybe you grew up and you didn't have anything. And, and so you want to, you know, have things and whatever that why is, I mean, it's personal to you. And so when you, you know, identify and you connect with that, in those moments, that's when, you know, that's, 
what I call, you know, I guess similar to faith, you know, as is that anchor that keeps you, you know, just from going astray. So um, I really love that. And I love to ask people this question because, you know, you get to see people get really passionate about what it is that they're talking about when they start surrounding it with their why. Yeah, it's it's so true. And it does so many things for you. I mean, you mentioned that it, it really keeps you going. It keeps you focused on something. Overall, it, as you go through those, and it's, this is part of why the one thing resonated so much when I talked about those steps, but you you craft those goals. You craft everything that you're doing based on what your why is. And so right. ultimately, you set that in the long term. You set that in the distant future. And you know that these are just like you're, you know, you're skiing down a hill and you've got all the gates to hit in between you know, you have to hit every single one of those to get to the end. Sure. And when you're doing, when you're making a decision, I mean, I think about the way that, you know, with my why and, and really how it translates into my goals, that defines how I run my business, both in terms of the actions, but also in terms of the steps that I take, you know, I will, I will choose one property over another based on, you know, does it get me towards my goals? If I didn't have that, if I didn't have a why, I didn't have goals or and didn't have any of that together. I would, you know, you run off in a million different directions and you have no idea what you're doing. You never actually get anywhere because you just kind of try things, but Absolutely. that having a why anchors you back to all of it and really drives you to push. I mean, when I was working on scraping my floors yesterday in my rental for the, you know, four days a week for the past six weeks after working full time, I really didn't want to be there. Um, but you have a why and it pushes you through all of it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, so where do you see your rental business in, or your real estate business in five years? Um, I think the two sides to it. One, I, I will definitely be out of my job by then and I'll be investing full time um, and building my business full time. And then the second part of it is I really enjoy uh, and part of why I love what you're doing with this group is I love the um, the education and the networking aspect of it. And so I really want to I want to build that here in Charlotte as well. Um, we already have a meetup that I started last year as well. Um, we've got, you know, we have about 100 people in the group, but about 20 people that show up on a regular basis before the whole global pandemic thing. But um, really want to, I really want to have the, the largest group, the largest network for, you know, not just to hang out, get together and drink beers kind of thing, but like an actual meaningful platform of people that are driving towards um, whatever their goals are in real estate. So. I really want to develop that in the next five years as well and have it be the probably the most uh, selfishly and competitively the biggest one in Charlotte. So. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. We are going to take some questions and if I'm going to go through and try to see if we've missed any, um, let's see here. Uh, so we talked about the financing. Um, where, where again, um, are you investing in Charlotte? There was a couple of questions in there about that. Which town, which city? So I have, uh, I'm a little bit all over the place. I'm within, my current portfolio is all within about an hour of Charlotte. So Gastonia, Statesville and Salisbury. Statesville um, and where? And Salisbury is the third. Okay. It's on the way up to Winston-Salem. And then I also am investing now. Um, everything I have in a contract right now that I'm getting ready to close is in Fayetteville, right by Fort Bragg. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we have a question here. Are you finding decent help, contractors, handyman, painting? Um, no. Yeah, go ahead and talk. <laughs> you can go ahead and talk about that because that was actually one aspect I wanted to ask you to discuss with the group on how you um, do the work on your on your rentals. It, so... I mean, I, I laugh about it and I get frustrated about it, but at the end of the day, um, it's my fault because I didn't manage it properly in a lot of ways. So I, I've had, you know, I've gone through a number of different contractors in different ways. Um, some of them did go to work, but it kind of goes back to the whole principle of the e-myth and what people, what they talk about in the e-myth of, you know, people that run their own business versus people that work in their business. And a lot of times, I think that's something that you as an investor have to be really aware of is a lot of times the contractors, GCs, people that you're dealing with, they'll do really good work, but they that's their work. That's what they do. They're not necessarily going to be business people because if they were a business person, they would be hiring someone to do that. So you, a lot of times you don't, I mean, at least that I've found so far, 
Um, it's hard to find the ones that run a, a very tight ship and run a, a really fantastic business and are super organized and also do really good work. Um, and so understanding that you need to kind of take the lead and you need to manage it, um, which is where I'm running into trouble and I'm learning as I go in managing all of it. Um, but I think ultimately it just comes down to what I've learned from it is making sure that you set very, very clear expectations on the work, on the timeline, on exactly what needs to be done, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then just communication, set, set your expectations for communication, because that's where I run into even more problems is, you know, I don't mind uh, if there's going to be a delay, that's one thing. If there's going to be a delay and you don't tell me until after the delay has already happened, then that's another thing. So having that communication and expectation set up front, um, I think that's huge. And then also being willing to just jump in and do some of the stuff yourself. If you, you know, if you can make the time for it. Um, and I say make the time, not if you have the time, because you can typically right. always make time. Sure. Um, but just there's plenty of YouTube videos. There's plenty of ways that you can learn. Um, you know, maybe if you're doing like $1.2 million flips, you might not want to do it for the first time and make that your, your first work. For mine, it was a $92,000 duplex that I started on. So a little bit different, but um, sure. there's definitely a lot of stuff that you can do yourself. Everyone, everyone gets started somewhere, you know, and, and you have to do yeah. what it, you have to do what it takes, you know, to get started. So um, another question we have here was what method ratio do you use to determine PP to expected rental? Um, so I use I, I like using the, the ratios, the one percent as a very, very, very basic rule of thumb. But I also think it gets very misused. Um, I will only use it to qualify a deal to basically if it doesn't, if it won't meet the 1% rule. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know what that is, that's where yeah, rental that? values. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's where the rent, the total rent is 1% of the purchase price. So if you have a $500,000 house, that would mean that oh, the 1% rule would mean that it should rent for $5,000. Um, I, I, hesitate on that rule because I think people latch onto it and think that that's gospel and they think that it means that only one percent deals will be good deals but and then also every one percent deal will be a good deal for me based on the way that I run my numbers and my conservative um, estimates on reserves and whatnot I typically find myself needing about 1.5 or more in order for it to meet all of my criteria um, so it's a great starting point it's a great way to disqualify things but you also have to you have to make sure that you tailor it to your market because if you're, you know, if you're buying in even downtown Charlotte, um, you're not going to ever hit the 1% rule and you're going to price yourself out of deals. So you have to know yeah, your market. You can't be hitting that in New York either. So with the taxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she said, I'm new to the group. Can you speak to your experience with bigger pockets? It's, it's good. It's very, I mean, it's a huge resource. It, it's really, you can make anything out of it that you want to. Uh, you can find anything that you want to yeah. um, between the podcast, the books, the forums, all of that stuff. There is so much information available. Yeah, yeah. the calculators are great. Um, it's the thing that I, I, that I caution people on with the forums in particular, and really with anything in, in any type of education, is everyone has an opinion. Everyone, just like the 1% rule, everyone has something that works for them. And everyone has something that doesn't work for them. So I, I feel like I see too often when I'm, you know, talking to people in the in the um, forums, you you'll see someone new that jumps in and asks a question, and one person will say, I, I saw one two weeks ago. The guy asked a question about what people are investing in right now in this market, and one person made one comment about how you should stay away from multifamily properties. Um, and this guy commented on it or responded to it that the new guy. And said, "Oh, I didn't think about that. Good to know. I'll make sure I stay away from them." Like, don't do that. Don't take one person's opinion. It's the internet. Don't take one person's opinion and take that as gospel. Um, but it's a great place to go ask questions to get a ton of opinions. Not necessarily to get the exact direct fact that you need to solve your problem, but it'll present a ton of options to you, and it's a it's an incredible wealth of resources. So, all right, that's awesome. Hopefully, uh, that helped. Yes, that's great. What attracted you to the Fayetteville market? Uh, 
two things. One is cash flow. The other is stability. Um, in a time like right now, it, Fort Bragg is, I mean, if you talk about stability in a market, if Fort Bragg were to go away, that we have much bigger problems on our hands as a country than the real estate market. So um, you've got a, a demand pool that is, um, you know, Fayetteville may not grow massively. Um, and I probably won't be there for very, very long term. But for right now, to meet my goals of getting out of my job, it, it will produce absolutely fantastic cash flow. And it's full. It's a town full of people that are on government incomes. And government incomes are a good thing to have, as we a lot of us know in times like right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone else have any questions? Um, okay, we have another one here. Do you have a do you have a specific target IRR or an exit strategy? Um, right now, I I really I look less at IRR and I, I basically plan everything more in terms of maximizing my equity um, or my return on equity. Excuse me. So knowing right now for me for the next now probably three and a half years left on hitting my goal, but. Um, in the next three and a half years, my goal is to fully replace my income. Um, my target is to use, maximize that equity and turn it into deals as quick as possible. So um, if I can, you know, if it lowers the cash flow on one by pulling all the money out of it, but it allows me to do two more deals and I still maintain, you know, a break even or a little bit of cash flow, then great. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's very dependent in that regard, but everything is with a mind on, how do I maximize my return on equity? How do I maximize my return on my cash and my cash on cash investment? And how do I currently um, maximize my cash flow in order to allow me to get out of my job? And then after that, if we talk about this again in a couple of years, once I've achieved that, then the focus will shift to maximizing my absolute long-term IRR, maximizing my, you know, all yeah. the equity and everything else. But that that's my tiered goal to hit my my targets right now. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. This has been really great. Um, thank you for sharing us uh, with us your journey. And um, I'm going to open up if anyone wants to unmute and ask any questions, please feel free to do so at this time. Um, you know, go ahead and ask uh, Patrick any any questions that you may have. So, how can people get in touch with you, Patrick? Um, social media through uh, Instagram at Invest DGP. Um, Facebook, I have an invest DGP a Facebook page as well. Um, can reach out via email, Patrick at investdgp.com. And then, um, you can check out the website that I have www.investdgp.com. I try to on the website. What's that? I'm typing it in at the moment. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so we have patrick says thank you patrick your ambition and drive is very inspiring no need to wait for anything just do it thank you and well done thank you russell for chiming in yeah thank you russell appreciate it anyone else, anything else you want to tell the group that you feel is relevant maybe some tips on how to get started um you know we have some new people in the group that that hasn't done their first deal what do you say to those people um, we talked about the hitting the why, so I won't continue to beat that to death, but one more time, it's important. So make sure you know your why, um, set your goals, set all of that so that you know what you want and then pick something and go with it. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to do it forever. Um, by picking something and moving in that direction, you, that doesn't mean that you're going to do it for the rest of your life. For me, I picked multifamily, small multifamily. And I'm enjoying it right now, even though it comes with its difficulties, but pick one thing and then take action and go with it and just jump in. You're going to make mistakes. Don't wait for a home run deal. Don't wait for everything to be perfect. Um, and don't try to educate yourself forever. You can read all the books in the world and you're never going to learn everything you need to know. So read enough to get you comfortable, um, but then also get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's what's going to help you continue to get through it and push through it when things start to get difficult. That's absolutely correct. Couldn't agree more. So Adam wants to know how we got connected. 
So we got connected through our CPA, my CPA. I think he's, is he your CPA too? Mark Holbrook. He was on the last call. Um, Mark is a great CPA. If nobody has, if anyone in the group doesn't have CPA, please reach out to him. Um, Also, you know, um, he was on the last uh, meetup, Zoom uh, virtual meetup. And that replay is on our YouTube channel. Definitely check it out. Great, great episode. Um, but I, we got connected through Mark and Mark, um, you know, Patrick and I just hit it off. Uh, I really liked his spirit. I really liked the person that he is. Um, and, uh, we just connected. So we've been chatting and he's telling me about what he's, what he's doing down in North Carolina. And I thought it would be really great to introduce him to the group and, and have him share his journey. His, Mark, so uh, I have to say too, yeah, yeah go ahead. I want to, I want to add one plug in here real quick for you. Um, I know everybody, Rochelle is always the one asking questions. I've, after talking, I mean, I don't know what all, how all the rest of them go exactly, but um, talking to Rochelle, hearing the stuff that she's doing, hearing the stuff that's getting built, and everything that she has in flight, it's amazing. So I'm, I'm very excited to, every time I talk with you, I feel like there's something new that you're doing and that's going on. So I have to send that right back at you because it's, it's amazing. And I'm very excited to continue to learn from you on that stuff. Great, great. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I asked Mark to uh, go ahead and put his contact information in the, the chat box. Um, he went ahead and put his uh, email address in there. So reach out to him if you need some help with your taxes. Um, then we got a question Mark saying, is the man. yes, vetting agent asking for recommendation, bigger pockets, Facebook here. Um, not sure. Oh, someone I saw that. Someone asked a question right above that. Oh, okay. How do you vet an out-of-state agent? Oh. Well. Um, so I haven't done any out-of-state agents, but I can say the same thing applies. Um, it, the biggest thing is, for one, just like you were just talking about, Rochelle, having a conversation. Um, you can learn a lot just by sitting down and talking to someone. Now, that doesn't, you know, if you don't hit it off like that, they may not have the same type of personality as you, and that doesn't necessarily, it's not a bad thing, and it's not necessarily disqualifying, but you can learn a ton from the conversation that you have and then um, find people that are reputable in that market and ask them, ask for recommendations, ask Another for exactly thing, what Marlon. Um, I think Marlon asked that question. Um, I work with out of state brokers and realtors, and I will say that anyone who's willing to call you back, that's how you vet them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that helps. New deals because you know, at the end of the day, they have the supply or they have, you know, the supply and you're looking for what they have. So um, vetting an agent, um, you know, it's, it's really just about, you know, having, having, uh, if them, if they have a deal for you. So um, there's not really much to vet in terms of that. Um, it's just a matter of actually getting some agents to call you back. Uh, I think with- one, just to, just to add to that real quick on um, one thing that I've talked to my agent about a lot is, um, be conscious too of what you're asking of them and kind of the mutual respect and, and really what that means in some cases. So if you're asking them to go look at a bunch of very, very cheap properties all the time that aren't going to really net them a lot of money, A, you need to know that so that you're respectful of their time, but B, you also can qualify or disqualify them because if it's someone that is willing to go and take the time and has the time to go drive to a whole bunch of properties that they're going to make no money on, that means that they don't have anything better to do with their time as well. Um, And so you want to, there's kind of a, in my mind at least, and this is just hundred percent my opinion that could be wrong. um, But in my mind, there's also, there's a very um, important balance of someone who makes absolutely calls you back because there's nothing worse than someone who doesn't respond to you. Um, But also someone who has other things going on and is successful in other ways and isn't 100% relying on only your business. So I just want to add that. And and another way you can stand out for, uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get agents or brokers from out of state is, um, you know, because again, you know, they're, you're trying to vet them. They're also vetting you because, you know, that's what they do for a profession and they don't actually get paid until that you close on something. So, you know, their time is valuable as well. So I think that in order to uh, maybe come with some credibility, you know, uh, what I do is if I'm it being introduced to a new broker or a new agent, um, and I'm looking for something specific, 
I will go ahead and um, put together like a three page slideshow with something very professional with that says, you know, who I am, you know, what my mission is, what I'm looking for, my criteria and what I've done in the past. And if you send that over with the proof of funds, you know, that will get an agent's attention. So you will get, you know, someone good who will send you deals um, if they know that you're ready to pull the trigger and you'll close whenever the time is. He said, great, thank you. <laughs> okay. This has been great, everyone. Um, if there is no more questions, uh, we're going to say good evening. Um, we've been here on for just about an hour. And Patrick, we thank you so much for your time, uh, for your uh, sharing your journey with us and giving us lots of nuggets. The replay will be available um, to those of you uh, that would like to go back and uh, listen to it again. Um, and uh, yeah, so have a wonderful evening. And uh, we will be talking uh, in two weeks. And our host next week will, uh, in two weeks, will be Adam Churko, who uh, spoke at the first. And we will have an exciting event uh, planned for everyone. All right, take care, everyone. Have a great night. Bye bye. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate it.